As a word of caution, this episode contains a discussion of sexual abuse in the context of the Catholic Church, so please listen with discretion. It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. David Hume predicted the day would come when modern women and men would read about religious believers in history books and be baffled that anyone ever thought the gods were real or present. That they could appear in groves of trees or statues or dreams, Hume was a philosopher who predicted a steady advancement from primitive belief to civilized rational belief, from ideas about gods interacting with humans to a recognition that it was all superstition. It's been hundreds of years since Hume made that prediction. How was it held up? In the words of religious study scholar Robert Orsi, the future that Hume envisioned for the human race has not happened yet. The gods were not turned back at the borders of the modern. The unseeing of the gods was an achievement. The challenge is to see them again. Robert Orsi recently visited the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship to talk about how scholars should take special presences more seriously, whether they be God, angels, and other divine figures. How can religious studies scholars study religion without discounting or explaining these presences away? Orsi wrote a new book on the subject. It's called History and Presence, and we're talking about it in this interview. But before we get to that, I want to thank some of the people who recently reviewed the show. There's Zach0002, GNR Mormon, and Wally Wall. Each left reviews in iTunes, and you can do that as well. I really enjoy reading each review. You can also send questions and comments to me directly at mipodcast at byu.edu as well. We're joined by Robert Orsi, one of the foremost religious studies scholars working today on this episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast. Robert A. Orsi joins us today. He's the Grace Craddock Nagel Chair in Catholic Studies at Northwestern University. We're talking about his new book, History and Presence. Uh, can I call you Bob? Is that absolutely, what you Absolutely, okay, absolutely. Thanks for coming in uh, to the Maxwell Institute. Thank you for having me, Blair. It's a pleasure to be here, yeah. Let's dive right in with a big question here. We might as well start with one of the biggest questions of all, which is how do you, Robert Orsi, a scholar of religion, define religion? Yes, that's, uh, that is the biggest question of all. Well, first of all, let's let me say that I define it reluctantly. So maybe maybe we could proceed by a series of dicta that I follow myself. One is that any time the word religion is used, the historical context of it of that particular use must be understood. So in other words, the term has no essential meaning, but it's always a meaning that it's the meanings are always defined in place. So when someone says you are religious or not religious at a particular time and place, I think it's important to query that. That said, the other point that I, the other dicta is that religion, as the word is used today, has a particular modern history to it, and we have to be very mindful all the time of that history. Um, religion can designate, the word religion can, de it has been used in a disciplinary way to create certain di boundaries, disciplinary boundaries. So when you hear the word religion, you also are hearing not magic not superstition, not, uh, you know, not other things. And I think it's important to be aware at any moment of the disciplinary work that the word is doing. If you had to define it on the back of an envelope, how would you do that? Well, I'd begin where I'd begin with special beings. I'd say that it's uh, religion has to do with uh, human beings, relationships with special beings in the context of particular worlds of meaning. So in the context so of like in, in terms of Catholicism, these special beings would be Jesus, Mary in a very special way, the saints, that it's relationships with these beings and the full lived reality of everyday life, which includes politics, which includes families, which includes all of that. So religion is not separated in my understanding from all of those things. It is absolutely a part of it. That does not mean, however, that religion can be explained by those things or explained away by those things. And that, that I think, was the burden of history and presence was to, in a sense, set religion free, you know, recognizing its social Im implications and imbrications, but not seeing that as a sufficient approach. Hmm. Yeah, the temptation of some scholars then is to reduce religion to something that just humans do. They sort of bracket out the broader questions of transcendence or or supernatural, if you want to use those words. Or even when the supernatural comes in, they rush towards, I mean, if they pay any attention to it at all, they rush towards functional interpretations. Well, what does know, it do for that person? What does or, it do for this person? Or how is it functioning in this society? Yeah. As if that, that's an equation, I mean, that, as if that's a scientific equation that you can say, see, it is, a religion does X. 
but I think that once you set it into this dynamic, intersubjective, relational context, which includes special beings, it becomes much more complicated to trace lines of direct function because things get complicated in relationships. <laughs> you know, there's conscious, unconscious dimensions. Uh, and then, of course, as you know, in history and presence, I also say that these special beings come with their own intentions and their own volitions. And so they meet human beings. I mean, you know, all the people in, in my book felt that they were being encountered by these beings uh, who, especially in the case of the woman in Detroit during the Second World War, when Mary had a, an agenda very different from what this woman thought the, her agenda as a woman should be. It's Mary, the mother of Jesus. Yes. Yeah. And well, I, I can't wait to get into some of those specific examples. Let's. Your book fits into this genre of academic writing where the scholar is part of the story as well. So you're part of this book. Instead of speaking from a distant position of objectivity, you come in and out of the stories that you tell because you researched these people. You talk to a lot of the people that you write about. And you actually start the introduction by talking about your mother's devotion to Christ in the Eucharist, or what Mormons would call the sacrament. Let's talk about your mother's relationship and your relationship to your mother and, and the Eucharist. Well, the particular story I was telling, when, when you say that I come into the story, I don't think it's me so much as me, I, mean, I think it's more what you see is more the context of my perception and understanding. I mean, so I'm there, but but it's mostly what I'm trying to do is show that I come from a particular world. I, that world is the world that I that has shaped my reflections. I think about that world, and uh, I want that world to be put in relationship to scholarship and to other religious environments, so that we can you know there can be comparative work. So it's very important to me that people see that I come from a specific place, that I'm not a kind of uh, di it disembodied mind. The story about my mother is, um, you know, my mother was not an, my mother only went to high school. She was a very smart woman, but she wasn't an educated woman. But she had a very strong belief in the reality of Jesus in the Eucharist, the absolute reality. And the story that I tell there is that uh, the Cardinal of New York, and I forget the date, it was when Clinton was president, the Cardinal of, uh, when Clinton was president, he visited a Catholic church in South Africa with uh, Hillary Clinton. And the priest, the uh, pastor of that church, in, that Catholic church in South Africa, gave the two of them communion. And this proved to be scandalous in the mind of the Cardinal of New York. So the Cardinal of New York at the time said, uh, gave a, a, a searing sermon during Easter week, during Holy Week, gave a searing sermon condemning the priests in South Africa for giving communion to these two people who the cardinal said view it as a symbol. Yeah, they're not Catholic. They're, they're not Catholic. Catholics. Uh, she was a Methodist. He was, I forget what he was, a Baptist, Baptist I think. Baptist, I think, yeah. Yeah, Baptist. And so they, uh, and the cardinal made it clear, they don't think it's real. They think it's a symbol. They think it's a metaphor. And my mother, you know, just called him on that in a letter to the editor of the New York Daily News. She said, no, I mean, Jesus is really there. No one should be kept away from that table. Because he's really there. Because he's really there. Because he's really there. And so, uh, so I was struck by a couple of things in that story. One, by the cardinal's insistence, after 500 years, he was still using the language of the Catholic Reformation. He was still using the language that they view it as unreal. For them, it is only a, a symbol. So he was cutting a very sharp line there between Protestants and Catholics. And then my mother's sense of the reality of this sort of really troubling such normative distinctions. I mean, as far as she was concerned, that Protestant Catholic, it didn't matter because Jesus was really there. Um, so this is a sort of radical uh, interpretation of the, of the Eucharist. Yeah, this battle over the real presence involving the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper, whatever different traditions call it, kind of hinges on this interpretation of a scripture where Jesus says, take and eat, this is my body. And this verse is, you say, one of the sources, greatest sources of violence in Western history, mm. the question mm. of what Jesus meant by this is my body. Mm. Yeah, the violence is Catholic Protestant violence, which you know goes th throughout the 500 years after the Protestant Reformation. I'm at great pains in the book, and I, I'm sure this was clear to you, not to say that Protestants don't have concepts of presence. I, I, it is not what I'm saying at all. I mean, I, you know, what I am saying, however, it is that is that it behooves us pay attention to that moment in history uh, when that question was so fiercely, violently debated with this widespread sense that there was a Catholic sense of presence that was different. Catholics thought that, Protestants thought that that uh, Jesus was there in flesh and blood, and that that reality 
was also true elsewhere. It was a, so Catholic, I called them people of presence at one point because that idea suffuses Catholic reality. So relics, statues, images, places, uh, presence is part of the, uh, of, of the experience of all of these other phenomena as well. The saint is present in the relic. You could kiss the relic and by kissing the relic, you're kissing the holy figure. And that's a very consequential distinction. Hmm. You know, I think it's, uh, it's a very consequential distinction. Uh, part of it has to do with materiality. Part of it has to do with embodiment. Part of it has to do with authority. Uh, but nonetheless, Catholics have this particular notion of presence. And then this debate, I argue, gets carried around the world in the age of exploration when Protestant and Catholic missionaries, and it becomes a template for approaching other religions. So you have good religions and bad religions. The bad religions are religions like Hinduism or the varieties of Hinduism, the variety of South Asian religions we now call Hinduism. Um, Which also had shrines and presences and things. Absolutely, pilgrimages and so forth. That's bad religion. Buddhism, as it was construed by French rationalists in the 19th century, Buddhism was a scientific religion. It was a religion of the mind. It's it contemplative was, it's, spirit. It's yeah. contemplative spirit. And, uh, you know, I think I awoke slowly to this when I read the famous Stages of Faith. Uh, James Fowler. James Fowler's book on Stages of Faith. And I realized, you know, he says these, Fowler claims, and he, he himself is at, at pains to say that these are not normative, but it's hard not to see them as normative because... Yeah. He's saying there's like primitive, like low level religion is stage one is like f flesh and presence. And he would say even superstitious. Absolutely. And then you graduate, you become enlightened right. to the higher spiritual. Absolutely. And, and you're, yeah. when you're at the top, it's disembodied. Yeah. It's mostly ethical yeah. uh, and so forth. And, you know, as a Catholic, that meant that to study religion was to contribute to boundary making. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking with Robert Orsi. He's the Grace Craddock Nagel Chair in Catholic Studies at Northwestern University and uh, the author of History and Presence. Bob, most Catholics believe in a community of people here on earth that's connected to a broader community of saints and angels. The living and the dead are all interacting with each other in Catholicism. And mm -hmm. chapter five mm -hmm. of your book is called The Dead in the Company of the Living. And I want to set this up a little bit. In part of this chapter, you yourself visited a Catholic home where a little boy had died at age five after several years of suffering. And, and in his bedroom hung a lithograph of the tortured and bloody crucified Jesus. This yes. is an image of Jesus. Jesus there and, and the boy's parents would welcome visitors after his death from around the world to visit the boy's little room. Tell mm -hmm. us about that experience. Well, what happened was a mother who was, of course, distraught with grief after her son uh, died, her five-year-old son died. And, and he had been, she says at one point in, in something she wrote or maybe something she told me that she, he had spent most of his childhood in hospitals because he had he was very sick. Anyway, he died when he was five, and uh, she was sitting in his room uh, on his bed, a little, little room, which is important for the story later, looking at an image of the uh, on a crucifix of Jesus, uh, an image of a crucifix. So it's important that it was actually kind of a lithograph type thing. And uh, she was sitting there, and she was asking God why it had happened. Why did this happen? Why? Um, and she began to pray that she could see her son one last time, which, of course, as anybody who has lost someone knows, that's, of course, a, a very understandable desire. And she looked up again at the image, and a little dot had appeared in one of the corners of the image. And over time, the next couple of days, the dot grew larger, and uh, it turned out to be the face of her son in the image. So she kept this to herself for a while, and then in, in, after a few days, she invited her husband in to see it. And he saw the boy, too. So now they had sort of confirmation that, the, that it wasn't just her. And one of the points I make in the book is that she really did struggle to understand what kind of experience this was and, you know, where it fit in with the Catholic, Catholic teaching. So anyway, he, uh, they both see it, and then they, they, they decide to go to their pastor. And he comes over, and here there are different versions of the story. In one version, he crumples the image and then smooths it out, and the image and the little boy's face is still there. In another, and I, for reasons that are escaping me now, I trust this story. In a, in a second version, he asks to see another image in the house because he, he wants to compare. Uh, he wants to compare this image with another one, with another holy image. And he looks at them and he says, "No, this is clearly this is clearly something miraculous." So from that point on, they had gotten a kind of. 
this was never officially approved by the church, but they were eager to have their parish priests at least tell them that they were not doing anything wrong. Right. This wasn't unorthodox in some this way. This wasn't unorthodox in some way, right. So, uh, and then gradually, by word of mouth only, the word, word went out and people began to come. And soon, people began to see their own dead in the image. Uh, they, they saw the little boy, but they also saw their own dead. And then on one day, they, somebody saw a living member of their family. And this was very frightening because they were expecting to see only the dead. Uh, so the couple who ran the shrine, it was their home, they had to figure out then why a living person. And they finally decided that God simply wanted the people who come to the shrine to see the people in their lives who most needed prayer or most needed attention. Uh, and that's, uh, that's, uh, that's where I come in now because I decided to go with a group. A friend of mine had found out about this. I forget how he did. We called up and I asked if I could come out. We set an appointment very far in advance, actually, because uh, it was such a there was such a stream of pilgrims. About what year was this? Um, eighty seven. So it was in the eighties. Okay, no, eighty seven. We went out. Me and a group of um, of friends, a friend of mine who found it, his mother who was in her late sixties at the time, his girlfriend who was Jewish, his sister, his brother in law, and me. So we all piled into this car and we went out. And we found the place, and uh, the woman told us the story, and she welcomed us, and uh, then we went up into the room. And I think what was striking too, so she she brought us into the room, and she said, "Okay, now here's the, you know, here's the image. Here, and again, it was very small, and there were six of us or so. Here's the image. Was uh, it dark in there at all? No, it was. It was. I think I don't remember clearly, but I think it was lit. Okay. Uh, I mean, it wasn't brightly lit, but it was. I mean, there was okay. a lamp of some sort. Okay. And. Uh, you know, she was very encouraging, but, you know, she said, you, you know, you might see something. Don't be afraid. This isn't something weird. This isn't something creepy. You know, this is something from God. So don't, uh, don't be afraid. And then she said, okay, I'll come back in a half an hour or so, 45 minutes. And she left and closed the door and we were all in this little room. And then suddenly people began seeing things in the image. And um, as I write in the book, I saw something too. I saw, and I was not expecting to see it. Um, although I, you know, I did grow up Catholic, and so I, this was not an unfamiliar world to me. But I saw a, a sort of a, of a sort of tall, skinny nun in one of the corners of the of the image. Did it move? Was it just in? It was just sort of a no. Depiction she just of stood one? still. Yeah. And you could. And this wasn't a trick of your eyes. You saw this with your own eyes. Yeah. So it seems. Uh, uh, and again, we were and we were looking around. We were bending over, le leaning over each other, looking over each other's shoulders. So there was a lot of movement in the room. But uh, I definitely saw something. Yeah. So how? So you tell this story in your book. How do you think your approach to telling that story might differ from other religious studies scholars, particularly the type that you're trying to sort of push back against or sort of shift the conversation with? How how would their telling of this account differ from what you're doing? Well, first let me say that uh, you know anthropologists, I think, would I mean this would be familiar to them, this kind of involvement. Although, let me note that, you know, the famous participant observation is uh, of uh, anthropologists. It doesn't mean that they have to participate in ceremonies, but it's an option. And I decided to go into this. I mean, I didn't see myself as participating in a religious ritual so much, but in any case, I went in. So I don't think anthropologists would be surprised, but I think religious studies as a discipline, the study, the academic study of religion, really try to build a firewall between scholars of religion and, and such experiences. And you know, there's a danger, I think, uh, and this has changed in the last 10 years, it's changing, but there was, a, there was a danger that you would not be believed, that you'd be seen as credulous. When, you know, in fact, a, as I, you know, quite apart from any supernatural explanation, and I, I, you know, I'm not inclined to make supernatural explanations, but, you know, just in terms of a human explanation, you know, having grown up in the tradition, being there with friends, being in this room, having been prepared for this, I mean, you could see how it's not that mysterious that I should come to this point um, it's really interesting because it, in other stories you do treat for example visions of mary you treat mary almost as a historical actor which some scholars would say then that you are allowing the supernatural to play a role in your work well i want it i mean absolutely because it plays a role in these people's lives and it's not for them a metaphor it's not a function and you know when we when we turn away from the really realness of these figures in people's lives, we lose, uh, we lose something of the power of these religious moments. So, for example, as I tell it, I, I, you know, I situate the story of this boy in the context of changing Catholic burial practices. 
following the Second Vatican Council, which was 1962 to 1965, you know, which was Catholicism's moment of modernization when they tried to bring the church into the modern world. And there was a real de-emphasis on praying by the by the by the corpse, you know, at wakes. There was wakes a, changed, yeah. Yeah, there was a de-emphasis on wakes. There was a de-emphasis on saying the rosary at wakes. Uh, they changed the colors of the liturgy, the funeral liturgy from black to white. You know, these are enormous changes that people are asked to accept at a very painful moment of their lives, you know, one of the most painful moments. So uh, uh, Catholic burial practices were changing in terms of Catholic cemeteries. Uh, I, I talk about how cemeteries were being more carefully administered in this period, a kind of uh, institutional framework had developed. And it became clear as this little boy, as they got deeper and deeper into this little boy's life, that he was not happy with these events. And I think, however you want to talk about this, and I think that's part of the challenge, is to come up with a richer repertoire of theories and understandings and to, to come up to understand this. That little boy had ideas about how he was to be treated in the afterlife. You would use new language, for example, abundant events is one of the terms that you came up with. How do you describe an abundant event to someone? Like, how would you have described it to your mother who was a practicing Catholic? And you said she's an intelligent woman, but she's not necessarily academically inclined. So how would you present abundant events to someone like that? Well, it's an encounter with uh, a holy figure. In the context of one's life, in the circumstances of one's life, it's a, it's an encounter which is experienced by the person as absolutely real, as real as you and I are sitting here across this table talking to each other. And it's not always anticipated. And what, what struck me and, and kind of what led me into this project in the first place was the language that people use. They always use, they always use the language of, uh, it came to me. You know, she came to me. Like the, the Virgin, Virgin Mary, Mary came, came to me, to me. Yeah. and and I thought that needed to be addressed. That needed to be attended to. What does it mean then in these moments when when a human is approached by a holy figure in that human's religious pantheon? What happens then? And I try to suggest, and I try to suggest theoretical possibilities. Um, you know, I try to suggest that these figures come and confront people with other possibilities. How do you separate the stories of what they tell from the event itself? There's a way that, you know, people, they say these things come to them. For example, the Virgin Mary might appear to someone and they talk about it. But the talking about it, do you differentiate between the talking about it versus the actual event that they experienced? Well, you know, so much of modern academic life, so much of modern academic thought, intellectual thought, is premised upon a series of such distinctions, you know, between the object and the language is, you know, and there has been, or the, the, the real and the interpretation, uh, mm -hmm. and there has been a movement and, and there's been a turn in recent years to collapse the distinction between the discursive and the, and the experiential. So in the thing in, that's talked about and the thing that happened, the thing that's yeah. talked about and the thing that's happened. So obviously, obviously the people I spoke to having grown up Catholic, all of them, except for the Jewish girl. Um, were raised in a particular discursive tradition, and they were using the language of that discursive mm -hmm. tradition. But that said, I, I don't. I, I guess I'm a kind of linguistic realist in some ways, which not which does not mean that I am saying that the thing to which is the thing that is referred to in language is ontologically separate from the world of human experience. What I am saying is, if people say this figure came to me, we as scholars of historical cultural phenomena must attend to that language and without trying to explain it or without you know we have to hear it this is what they are saying now let's think about this experience in history you mentioned the people that were with you and most of them had a catholic background as you did but there's also someone with a jewish background was there any sense at all of a of a sense of voyeurism in the experience or the sense of sort of invading a space that some people would see this as a very sacred space and and to go in there and, and analyze it it's sort of like you know dissecting a frog <laughs> the frog has to die in yeah, order for yeah. you to do that well i mean i wasn't dissecting it while i was there i mean the frog and i had a moment together before okay. i got to work on it and i would not have uh you know, I wouldn't have been able to analyze it had I not been there and, and seen what happened and been part of that event. So, I mean, it, it, there, that was very important. Um, but voyeurism, no. Uh, one of the things that struck me was how carefully the couple created a respectful environment. Now, I have to say, this was a very, this was sort of a working class community. These were recognizable to me 
working class, you know, formerly working class people, you know, there was nothing spooky about it. There was nothing Halloween-ish about it. And the house wasn't, it was a very plain kind of working class suburban home with a living room. The, the husband of the woman who was leading us through this all, you know, he was watching television the whole time and smoking cigarettes. And so it could not have been more normal actually for that particular moment in time. Mm. Um, so it wasn't like we were going into a heavily marked space. So there was there was nothing that would have called forth a kind of you know voyeurism. Or having said that, though, I have to say one member of the of our group was for various reasons of his own that I'm not quite sure. He was in a very kind of cranky, satirical mood, and he kept up a pretty steady banter as things were going on in the room. In the room when the when the after the woman had left, mm. um, but it didn't seem to it didn't seem to affect anybody. It certainly didn't affect a young Jewish girl who. Mm as I, I described, saw her father in a tux, her deceased father in a tuxedo who was dancing um, with someone and she kept saying, like Fred Astaire, like Fred Astaire. It's, so, it's such an intimate space and you have people having such different experiences in there. I mean, you are kind of skeptical, sort of analytical uh, versus the Jewish woman who seemed pretty open to it versus someone who sounds quite cynical and all of you are packed into this little space yeah, where this literally, abundant literally event. literally crawling all over each other. Right, right. Where does the abundant come from? What does that word exactly refer to when you're talking about abundance? Is it like something that you can't, it's something above and beyond what you can wrap your arms around or what is that? I, abundant, I, I thought for a while of calling it excessive empiricism because, you know, abundant is hooked to not only event but to empiricism. So yeah. I, I talk about an abundant empiricism. That's definitely a more jargony. <laughs> Which one? Excessive? E empiricism. Yeah. Like you em went for the event. Right. Yeah. So event, but empiric. But I, what I meant by that was simply a radical attention to the world as the world is experienced by the people among whom I go to study or to understand. Yeah. Uh, not making translations immediately from their language, not transposing their, not, I, you know, it's not up to me to decide what is the important things in this in this environment until I hear from them, and I cannot dismiss their interpretations. I quote somebody, I quote a scholar of religion in the book who says somewhere that if you want to understand the religious experience, the last people you go to are the people who actually had that experience because they're, they're going to be the last ones to be able to tell you anything about that experience, and that's just, mm. you know, I, I just can't get behind that kind well, of sentiment to have a specific example in the book you talk about young children that are having visions of of mary like all of these mary visions happen and and previous treatments of that experience will explain it sort of historically they'll say well in this particular area there was these other types of visions that were happening and so these ideas were in the air and scholars will want to sort of reduce things down to that explanation that the people who experienced it wouldn't have been able to tell you that history necessarily. Maybe not, but what I do want to emphasize, and I keep emphasizing this, that uh, I am not suggesting that these events should or could or ought to be approached apart from a thick historical explanation. And so everything that, so I, I talk about it, this in, in my discussion, my brief discussion of Lourdes, you know, it is important you know, where the railroads were running, it is important that there was a kind of controversy in the church at that time about something. All of that is absolutely true. And you cannot, I am not proposing to take these events out of history. I, what I, in fact, if anything, I see myself as sticking them even more deeply into history. By paying more attention. By paying more attention to- Even what, to what they say about what To what, what they happened. say. Yeah. And so once the Virgin Mary comes, now I want to say, okay, now the Virgin Mary is here. How does this change the circumstances? How does this change local dynamics without assuming that, well, you know, this is a political trope? Yeah, you do the same thing with the woman in Detroit around the time of World War II. Maybe spend a second talking about that story and how you do talk about the context of these visions that happen, but you also allow space for, the, for something abundant, for something more. Well, that's a really great example because um, – so here's a woman in – at the end – towards the end of the Second World War, she has – several brothers in service, in the armed service. Uh, she finds out that they're in the, she learns that they're in the Pacific Theater. Her correspondence with them is uh, censored and intermittent, and so there isn't a lot of, she's not getting a lot of, but what she is reading, she's reading newspapers accounts of how atro atrocious the war in the, in the Pacific are, and she's, she feels a great concern and responsibility to do something to protect her brothers or to take care of her brothers. But she feels now, of course, utterly powerless. So she's in the middle of this. And at one point, she's in the middle of these conflicting emotions. And at one point, she prays to the Virgin Mary and says, I will do anything. You know, I will, I will, uh, I'm going, I'm going to save more tin. I'm going to save more string. I'm going to 
sell more war bonds. I'm going to give more blood. And, and that's when the, she hears a voice that says to her, none of that is going to make any difference. You, that is not going to help your brothers. Don't do those things. Uh, what you need to do is gather women together uh, and pray to me. G gather women together like you who are worried about their their loved ones and, and pray to me and I will be there with you in, in the midst of prayer. Well, it's especially unusual because Catholics at this time were really trying to prove their American identities, Absolutely. right? So like they were supposed to be doing selling war bonds right. and doing all that. Like that was... And also, as I think I quote in there, there was a very strong sense. Uh, I mean, historians of the home front point out that war bonds and, and scrap metal drives and so forth were targeted to women in particular to give them a sense of connectedness to the war front. I mean, this was a way psychologically, uh, both literally and psychologically, for women to stay in touch. And she was, Mary was saying, no, it's, that's not how it works. It was not uncommon in the, in the papers in those days and on radio to hear people say, well, you know, if you don't sell, if you don't buy war bonds, if you don't give blood, you are contributing to the death of our soldiers over. So she was facing, the, the woman was being challenged in a very subversive way. And, and why not leave it at that then, right? Because scholars could just say, look, this is a woman who had a lot of pressure and this could be like a release valve. Like she could have sort of even hallucinated this experience to sort of take off the pressure and let her do something else rather than all the things she's being pressured to do. Why not just leave the story at that then? Well, I just don't see what the language of hallucination gets us. You know, where it doesn't take us into the intimacy of the experience. It doesn't take us into the, the reality of the experience uh, in, this woman's, in this woman's life. It doesn't take us into the consequences of the experience. And sure, I mean, obviously, all kinds of modern, I mean, this was the whole point in some ways of modern intellectual culture. It was precisely to explain these things, right? To explain the miraculous, to explain, to come up with naturalistic explanations for such phenomenon. But in the process, I think a, a violence was done not to religion, but to history, to the study of history and to people's religious experience. I mean, again, I try to approach these experiences as they are talked about and as they are, you know, as people say they experience them. And was that violence then this reduction, like having an automatic skepticism for yeah, or just or dismissal or, or, of or translate? I mean, I, I use the language of translation to translate them from one Okay. world of meaning into another world of meaning and and then to assert that this world of meaning is the superior yeah. world of meaning and to a believer to someone to the woman in detroit she would experience that description as a dismissal uh, oh absolutely right? absolutely right. um absolutely and of course you know church authorities in, in michigan were not happy with this vision because as you say they you know they were trying to become american although Although throughout, you know, until the 60s and actually afterwards, I mean, there have been Marian apparitions, lots of Marian apparitions all over the world, and including in the United States. There was a famous one in the Bronx in the later 40s. So, but they, they wanted to make sure that this was kept under, I mean, it's always a challenge for the church, which on the one hand encourages such beliefs, and on the other hand is confronted with the challenge of controlling such beliefs, because... You know, you don't want it's 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 a little bit akin to Weber's institutional charismatic uh, dichotomy. Yes, is Max uh, Weber the right. German, the German sociologist? But uh, I mean, one of the things I try to say is that these kinds of binaries, you know, living and dead, charismatic and institutional, just don't work because it's the institutional church that makes possible the experience. That's a part of why it's there. It's the encouragement of the institutional church that creates the grounds on which the experience grows. So it's hard to draw a, a, the kind of sharp line that Weber was suggesting between yeah. the charismatic and the institutional. Can the institution then sometimes also has difficulties with abundant events because of their abundance, because they're sort of overflowing. And you talk about in the book ways that the Catholic Church has sometimes tried to rein in things like cleaning oh. up shrine sites or having, you know, things like that. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, for lots of different reasons. One, for the danger that they'll get out of control. But also the danger that uh, that uh, they will be taken in directions that the church can't approve of, or um, and of course, I mean this happens. People pray for things that they that perhaps the church has not sanctioned. Um, one of the examples I use in another book of mine, thank you, Saint Jude, is women praying to Saint Jude after the Second World War to help them get jobs. He's the patron saint of hopeless causes, and you know the Catholic press and the American press were encouraging women not to work. They would to yeah. give up their jobs, to, to give the jobs to returning servicemen. 
and to stop working. And Catholics had a very strong moral impetus against women working. And so they were praying to St. Jude to give them something that went against the, 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 the din in the popular media. And when Jude granted them that request, they felt that their decision had been sanctified or gratified. <laughs> That's Robert Orsi. We're talking today about his book, History and Presence. He studies American Catholicism, and he also writes a lot on theory and method for the study of religion. Bob, in an interview that you did with uh, LDS historian Richard Bushman and, and Susanna Morrill, you, you said that scholars' personal background plays a role in their scholarship, and you said that it's you think it's critically important for scholars to be really clear about the anxieties and commitments that they bring to their work. So what are some anxieties and commitments that you bring to your work? Well, this changes over time, of course. My, I'm sure the anxieties and the commitments have changed as I've gotten older and you know, as my work has taken different directions. Certainly one of the first anxieties that I had to struggle with was I wanted to be uh, endorsed within the academy and there are certain things you can say and certain things you can't say. I've gotten much more, I've gotten much bolder as life has gone on in, in, in pushing the, those boundaries. What's your most bold academic heresy? Well, you know, I don't know about the boldest, but, but the very fact that I, that, that I use I and the fact yeah. that my own experience is part of this, again, not unusual in anthropology. Right very unusual in history. I mean, I think yes. that in the study of history, there's still tremendous prohibitions against the personal pronoun, the singular personal pronoun. So uh, also the, the mixing of ethnography and historiography, the mixing of the present and the past, the suggestion that the present and the past are not as sealed off from each other as we are led to believe by certain historical canons. Let's talk about what you brought to, you say it kind of changes over time. What about to your latest uh, history and presence? Was there something you brought along there? Well, there, you know, the final chapter is about the Catholic sex abuse crisis mm -hmm. approached through the perspective of survivors' own stories and their own voices and their own experiences. And there my anxiety was that I would not get their stories right. Mm. I mean, I'm open to challenging people, but my goal is not to destroy people's worlds. I mean, I know I'm not, that isn't what I'm out to do. And I, I, I felt I had to be very careful and thoughtful about how I talk to people and what questions I asked them. And so that was an anxiety. Yeah, that final chapter on, on sexual abuse scandals is difficult. It's, it's a troubling chapter. Talk about the decision to address that in this book. How did you come to that? Well, I wanted to talk about the ways in which I, I noticed that as I spoke to more and more survivors, again, I don't want to, this is not about all survivors because there are thousands and thousands of survivors around the world and in the United States. I'm talking about a very small subset. I was particularly interested in survivors who remained in some relationship with the church, however tormented, or with their Catholic inheritances, um, prayers and sacraments and so forth. And I learned that for many of them, presence was a, both a problem and a challenge. I mean, presence, the abundance of presence created a risk of their boundaries being broken again and they you know they were afraid of a violating god they didn't want this violating god on the other hand the person who had abused them was connected in catholicism to the person of god oh, like intimate priest stands in for intimate god. yeah the altar christus the other yeah. christ i mean it just makes it different not to say anything's lesser or, or worse or better but different from a athletic coach or a, or someone else abusing someone oh, it's a priest abusing yeah, someone absolutely absolutely i mean no i and and you know people have I have heard people say, I mean, people have said to me, well, you know, like the, the, the gymnastics coach, well, you know, he stood between these people and their, their children's Olympic ambitions. Okay, well, that is serious. And, and, and you know, that's, that's a good, and that, that good made everybody vulnerable, made the, it made the parents vulnerable to manipulation and so forth. But it's not the same as having the power to control, to, to forgive or not your sins or having the power to turn bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus, which you can then approach on the altar and consume. I mean, that is ontologically so far beyond what a coach does. Yeah, it, which, you know, it's, it's terrible however it goes. Absolutely. But one of the things your chapter did for me was to show me the way you coming from a Catholic background, a person might expect you to be almost apologetic or sort of try to give a context for that kind of abuse that that casts it in, in a light that eases some of the pain. But what you show, I felt like, was how that abuse being rooted in Catholicism actually made it even more painful for the people involved. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the, you know, this was the man who, this, to be abused by the man who effects the sacramental miracle 
I mean, that's a very powerful and painful thing. Was it, was it hard to talk to, to victims of abuse or to survivors of abuse, I should say? Was that difficult? It was difficult. Uh, it was difficult for them, certainly, to talk to me. And, and we had lots of, you know, we, we talked beforehand about any conditions that they would require. <laughs> and I checked in with them constantly to see if all was going well and if our conversation was proceeding in a comfortable way. I had a rule that anything I, that I needed to be transparent about anything I asked them. So I really tried to I tried to give them as much control over the over the conversations that we had over time as possible. So I even said, and, for, and no one has ever taken me up on this, but I even said that after we had completed our conversations together um, and we had done this final. So my method was to have a series of conversations, five, six, seven conversations of varying lengths. And then when we finally decided we'd explored the experience enough and we talked about their lives and their childhoods and their adulthoods and their marriages, that I would have one final conversation with them, although there was always a possibility of coming back. But I'd have a final conversation, the purpose of which was to get down with particular clarity their own special language for talking about this, you know, the words they use. And so I would go back over my notes and say, you said, this is how you express this. Can you help me understand one more time what you meant by this phrase? And then I gave that to them uh, so that they could take it away. Some of the fascinating stories were of people who, despite the incredible amount of pain that they had undergone as Catholics. They, Some of them would drift from the Catholic Church. They would have resentment toward the Catholic Church. They would leave the Catholic Church. And some of them, even later on, would just find themselves drawn back uh, in some ways. And part of the story then is about how some of these people were trying to return to a Catholic register of worship, or even that they could, some of them seemed like they couldn't help but return to that in spite of themselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that the book all that my last two books have been concerned with actually it's a it's a theme that goes through all all my recent work which is how deeply and how systematically catholic children in the united states were formed in the faith by an army of nuns and priests and religious brothers who were at varying degrees of sophistication prepared with a, a whole technology of formation so from, like the catechism that they would recite, the lessons they would learn. You, oh, but that's all too intellectual. It's, there's, even the, to the things. There's toys see, yeah. and, and uh, toys and, and uh, dolls and little priest dolls that you can mm -hmm. move around and cutouts and coloring books and fairy you know, stories, lives of the saints and uh, comic books, comic said, books even, yeah. adventure stories. You know, there was a whole world that contributed to, to this formation. And you yourself experienced some of that growing up. Oh, yeah. I grew up in an Italian neighborhood in the Bronx, and uh, I went to Catholic school from kindergarten to senior year of high school. We talked a little bit earlier about Fowler's stages of faith. How would you, how do you characterize your religious beliefs today? And, and do you notice any parallels with Fowler's stages? Or where are you at today with, with your religiosity? Well, first, I, I do want to I do want to remind us that I'm intensely critical of Fowler's stages of faith because I find them to be Protestant centric and a certain kind condescending of a certain a little kind bit. of condescending and uh, uh, and condescending and uh, and look at what's at stake. I mean, they present themselves as a developmental roadmap to the pinnacle of religiosity and health and psychological health. health. I mean, so. You know, you go up these stages, and I remember discovering at one point I was reading this book again, and I was thinking, okay, well, like, where do, like, where does my family come fit on this? And they were like yeah. two, two point five or something, yeah. precisely because of their understanding of of uh, the real presence, presence. and yeah. saints and statues and so forth. So, I mean, it was really, it's a it's a developmental model. It's a, it's a normative model masked as a developmental model. Yeah. So where do I where do I um, where do I fit? I, I often say to my students when I get to the discussion of the varieties of Judaism in the United States that if I had my druthers, I if I I, I wish that Catholicism had an option like um, conservative Judaism, which would be a deep respect for the lived tradition in all its variety uh, and all its you know all the ways in which it might be acceptable to me and unacceptable to me a deep respect for the piety of people, of ordinary people, and at the same time, a progressive political politics. But, you know, Catholics don't have that option. We don't really have the option of choosing the particular form of, form of our Catholicism necessarily. I mean, you know, we won't, get it, we, we won't get it approved. You know, I'm not a Catholic in good standing at this point. 
but do, are you a religious believer? Do you do you have a sense of personal worship or connection with God or some above and beyond something something abundant? I guess I have a sense of abundance. Absolutely, I do have a sense of abundance. I, I wouldn't call it belief. And I don't, I don't use the language of practicing as mm. if do I go every Sunday, the answer to that would be no. Mm. But do I have some you know, deep c connections that are existential, emotional, um, aesthetic, sp you know, spiritual, all tied up? Absolutely, absolutely. Is it uncomfortable to talk about that? Uh, or, or is that something that just doesn't really come up usually in the context of your work? Well, it, it comes up all the time in the sense that people ask me, do I believe that a figure that I'm talking about, like that virgin, do I believe that the virgin really, and at that point they're asking me a question about my belief. Yeah. And they're also framing it within a particular model of religious phenomenology, which is either it is real according to the con to the conditions of natural science, or it is unreal. And those are the only two options. And I, I reject, you know, I reject that uh, trap. And that's the hardest thing, I think, for most people to wrap their heads around is what you mean by that rejection. Like, so what what is it? And I'm, I am reminded of a, a story that you talk about in the book where there's a young Catholic boy who's kind of a problem, Dennis the Menace type figure in a way, and, and the Protestants are giving him a hard time and, and they're trying to make him say like – I can't uh, to say. I can't say. There's no there there, because like, right. he, he thinks the real presence of Jesus is in that church, and the Protestants are making fun of him. They for want that. him to say. They threaten him. This yeah. is a, this is fiction. This is yeah. a, a yeah. piece of early, I mean, mid 20th century fiction, written by a Jesuit priest uh, for boys. Um, and it was uh, yes, they wanted the Protestant boys want the Catholic boy to say there's nobody in the tabernacle. Yeah. And they threaten that if he doesn't, they're going to beat him up, yeah. uh, dunk him in the river, which eventually, as you know, kills him. And so he yeah. actually dies. He's a martyr. He's a martyr, yeah. Because he refuses to say um, that, it's not not there, that yeah. it's not there. So, so do, you, do you feel like people ever are trying to do that to you? Like, Bob, you got to say, tell us it's there. Right. Well, that was like, to, you know, in, a, in, a, in, a, you know, in all of these conversations, there is this both epistemologically and experientially, I have always seen myself as an in-between figure. In my earliest work where I was trying to talk about the unique place of the scholar of religion, I, I talked about that person's in-betweenness. You know, that person is, has, you know, one gaze on the world of religious practice and another on the academic environment. And this person occupies this somewhat sometimes uncomfortable ground between them and i would say the same about my epistemology that it's it's an in-between epistemology it's it neither speaks to the realness or the unrealness but to the rea i mean i i want to talk to the about the realness of it but within a particular philosophical framework yeah that's i think that's the hardest part about about getting through this book is if, for people who check it out is trying to trying to pin you down. People will want to pin you down in categories that you're actually actively trying trying to get around. Subvert. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I know. I mean, it's uh, you know the whole project of the book is to subvert these categories, subvert these binaries, to try to come up with a richer way to conceptualize human imagination and human experience. And then I'm continually being asked to to abandon yeah. the the what I consider you know the theoretical scaffolding of this book and its and its larger point. Yeah. One of the things that you have said in this book, In History and Presence, is scholarship entails risk for the person whose world has been entered by the scholar, but also for the scholar whose own uncertainties ought to be on the line in the encounter. So where were your uncertainties challenged in history and presence? Well, all the things we're talking about. I mean, I, I grew up in a, you know, I mean, I, I grew up Catholic, but I was trained in an intellectual environment. I mean, I know my Kant, I know my Plato, I know my uh, my philosoph, I know my Descartes, I know my philosophical traditions, and so, and I know the value of those and what they were trying to do. What would you say to Catholics who say, "Well, that that's your problem. All of that eroded away your connection to what we as Catholics see as the abundant." I would say, you know, you don't get to choose when you live, where you live in history, and I, it's not like I can. It's not like after we can just say, "Well, we're going to ignore all of that critical." theory, we're going to ignore all the critical philosophy, we're going to ignore, ignore psychoanalysis, and we're just going to affirm these things as if none of that ever happened. Well, you don't really get to do that. Mm. So the other side of that coin then is scholarship also entails risk for the people whose world is being encountered by the scholar. So what kind of risks are there for those people? Oh, that will misuse their world, that will we'll take it away from them in some way, we'll transform it into some other register, we'll tell other stories about it that aren't their stories, and we'll sort of, we, and we won't be adequately respectful of where the boundary is between what we're thinking, what 
they're thinking, and we'll sort of abs- we'll absorb their narratives into ours. Yeah, I, uh, the danger, the risks of exposure, um, you know, of being recognized in books. If, uh, you know, I I tell my the people I speak to that I. I there are all kinds of ways in which I honor and respect their anonymity if that's what they want, but you know they have to trust me. That's Robert Orsi. We're talking today about his book History and Presence. I also wanted to ask about reactions to your work. Have you ever been called an apologist for what you do because you're trying not to bracket out abundant or divine presences? No, I don't think anybody has ever called me an apologist. I, I think the worst that it's gotten is they've called me an El- Eliadian and. And that has been sufficient. That's been a sufficient denunciation. But, you know, for the most most part, my work is, I think, respectfully received and it, it's talked about. What would that mean for most, like, Eliad, the scholar? Like, what do they mean by that accusation? Well, I think the misunderstanding of Eliad is that he thought that there were these events, which he called hierophanies, that akin to what I'm talking about as a, abundant experiences or abundant events. And that, but they, there's always a sense that he reduced all of this to a singular plane so that he could look across vast terrains of geography and time and say, look, that experience is like this experience. Hmm. And I, you know, I'm clearly not doing that okay. because I'm a social historian. And yeah. so I'm in, uh, utterly preoccupied with the nitty gritty of particular worlds. Yeah. yeah. He was much more macro sort of trying to make connections right it's sort of almost you know, it was kind of colonial it was sort of absolutely yeah, where yeah. i'm much more micro and sort of sort of building this up yeah. from pieces of these worlds see and and when you're doing that you're personally interacting with people uh religious people and talking to them about their lives and really personal experiences has anyone that you've interviewed in the past is there anyone in particular that has stuck with you now that this project is completed are there any presences you might say that sort of linger in your mind or that come to mind well obviously the ones in this most recent book are very strong to me and i think when i when you know to think about that question it's uh it's i think it's really was the women i spoke to when i was doing my book on saint june who were an incredible group of women and they were very they were very honest and at at times brutally so transparent they challenged me they tested me they asked me questions and i think that group was where i really learned how to do ethnography because they were the ones who i mean i realized that I was really entering a world of relationships and they and I and I they were not going to just let me be a kind of invisible figure. They wanted to know about my lives and mm-hmm. what I thought about St. Jude and you know did I share this belief and you know and and I would say no I don't and then they would then they would have to react to that but that I think led for a richer and more honest uh, e- engagement exchange. So maybe they're still there in the back of your mind sort of keeping you focused on on how you interact with yeah, one woman. One woman. I think I. I think I cite this in the Saint Jude book. But one or someplace. But one woman said that if uh, if I revealed her name, she would rip my nose off. <laughs> She'd find me and rip my nose off. But it was also from them and, that I. And came... what's her name? No. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, it was also from them that I learned how much people think about these things and how it's not. I mean, I. I think that along with that sort of normative gridding of experience, there's a sense almost that certain kinds of religious experiences are mindless. You know, and, and I, that's yeah. why the word belief is so bad because mm. it, it, it implies a kind of kind of closure. Do you or do you not? And if you do, then then it's like all your critical questions have gone. But what I have found in talking to people who's who, who would define themselves as actively engaged in their religions, I have found that they're you know they're thinking and that they think, and the more they think, questions come up, and they have to work with those things. Yeah, and and those things affect how they live I and those things affect how they thing. lived absolutely yeah. Yeah. absolutely and and how they think about those things arises from their lived experience yeah, yeah. that's one of the things i feel like you do uh, that you're really struggling to do in the book and and in ways that i don't find in many other books is trying to find not to cover one side of that equation without leaving the other side of that equation. well that uh, that accounts for something of the of the poetics of the book where yeah. you know, those pieces yeah, that, they're vignettes so you'll talk about a story and then you'll do some like analysis or discourse and i try discourse. to weave the them all together yes. in, in a way that I think uh, connects the religious to the social yeah. and to the theoretical much more intimately and immediately. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a wonderful book, History and Presence. Before we talk about your upcoming project, there's one other question I had about the sorts of gifts that scholars of religion, especially if they're taking your approach, can offer to human society and perhaps the kind of curses or drawbacks that can come from your kind of approach. 
Well, I think one of the things that we can offer is what I've called elsewhere a disciplined attention to the world of religious practitioners. And that, that, sounds, that may sound banal, but it's actually quite difficult to discipline yourself in such a way that you are capable of attending to a religious world without anxiously translating it into your world, or without dismissing it, or without passing judgment on it, that you, you, have the, you have the training and the discipline to pay attention. I also think that we, could, we challenge people to move away from essentialism. So you'll never get a scholar of religion talking about Islam. Um, or it's, I, th th this came up recently when Loyola made the final four, a Catholic school mm -hmm. made the final four. And there was all this talk about why, why are Catholic schools... Go retrievers. Right. right. <laughs> why are Catholic schools good at basketball? And you know, all these you know, ideas started coming out know, well, because of this, because of that. And, and it had to do... The, the popular press was like looking for a Catholic answer to that. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm open to that, obviously. I mean, I think they're... But you know, it has to do with the fact that Catholic schools have become richer over the last 25 or 30 years. They've got huge endowments now, and they're able to buy base basketball players. They're able to compete in the market for basketball players. I mean, you know, I, it was hard for me to listen to how old Catholics play basketball more than anybody else when I, you know, I spent 15 years teaching in Indiana, and I think Hoosiers would take an exception to yeah. that. <laughs> That's right. Uh, yeah, so some of the gifts that scholars can offer religious believers then is just this disciplined attention and, 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 and thoughtful engagement. How about on the other side of that? What kind of gifts have you received, do you think, from, from religious believers as you've done your scholarship? I, I've been impressed by their thoughtfulness, their generosity, um, their humor. Uh, I've learned uh, in a very visceral way. I mean, I think Clifford Geertz, the anthropologist, says this in his famous 1973 essay on religion as a cultural system. He says, you know, religion is not... There isn't a single religious emotion. Um, there is, you know, there's laughter, there's, there's bitterness, there's sorrow, there's joy, there's exhilaration, there's humor. And I, I think that one of the things that I've learned from the people I've went among is just in, their, in the context, because I go, you know, I try to get as much as possible into the interstices of their lives, that that's really true. That was a very, I think that's a profound essay, and I think that's one of the profound comments in there. That So I've certainly seen that. <laughs> That's Robert A. Orsi. He's the Grace Craddock Nagel Chair in Catholic Studies at Northwestern University. He's a specialist in American Catholicism and writes books on theory and method for the study of religion. We talked about his latest book today, History and Presence. Uh, what have you got on the docket right now? Have you got any projects that you're working on right now? Yes. So I'm working on a um, – it's changing, actually, as we speak, but I'm working on what might be – what I'm now thinking of as a history of Catholic sexuality, American Catholic sexuality in the, in the 20th century with a particular eye on the sex abuse crisis. So I'm trying to contextualize the sex abuse crisis historically uh, and in terms of sort of Catholic understandings of sexuality, Catholic practices, and so forth, while at the same time – trying to bring the survivors who I've gotten to know and who, sort of allowing them to be my guides through this history a little bit. Um, so it's, uh, it's, again, mostly a historical work, but there'll be, you know, I'm, I'm continuing to do my conversations with survivors and I'm continuing to meet survivors and hang out with them. And so. Is that a ways out or how, how far out do you think that project no, it's, it's is? A few, it's a few years out, mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. We well, yeah. really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today, Bob. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure, really a pleasure to be here. Thank you.